I guess I'll be focusing a lot more on how the well nexus might play out in practice and particularly in terms of implementing policy and, as Dirk said, in the particular context of RED, which has the potential to create a lot more value in forest areas and therefore exacerbate the already existing kind of tension between land uses that exist. So this is generally what I'll, what I'll cover. But first of all, on to the... The definitions. I'm not sure how familiar most people are with RED, but um, there's two essential elements, I guess. The first one in, the, in terms of the scope is what kinds of activities that developing, country, um, developing countries can do that are eligible to be called RED activities. And the second also really important part of RED is that there's a financial transfer involved. So RED is envisaged to be um, a mechanism whereby developed countries will pay for emissions reductions. Um, in tropical forests in, in developing countries. Something else that I think is important to flag up front is that RED is very much in its early stages. Um, it, it, Cancun was the first time that there was solid international agreement on the, the basis of a framework. There's still a lot of details within that framework on things like financing and actually reference emissions levels and a whole lot of technical details that still haven't been agreed on. So there is broad international agreement that it's something worth pursuing and worth figuring out, but um, the details still haven't been finalised. Under the, the Cancun agreement, so there was um, broad recognition that a three-phase sort of approach is appropriate. So the first one focusing on readiness, the second phase as countries um, have implemented things like forest monitoring systems and um, tried to start working out things like land tenure and forest governance, um, would then move into policy implementation. And then the third and final phase is one of performance-based payments, um, which is a, a central aspect of RED. So RED's very much in the first phase in terms of readiness and building capacity and building support within developing countries um, to implement RED. Something that a lot of you may have heard about um, is the Indonesia... Um, Norway letter of intent. I guess that's one of the very big bilateral agreements that has received a lot of media attention where a billion dollars basically was put on the table for Indonesia to, to support Indonesia in doing a whole host of red readiness activities um, as well as implementing some forest policies, one of them being um, basically a ban on new concessions for land conversion for two years um, and the other one being increased enforcement for illegal logging. At the, that was a year ago that that process um, kind of became public and has been starting to be negotiated, but Indonesia still hasn't um, agreed. So I guess that, that demonstrates the difficulties that RED will have in terms of implementation. It's not just because there is money on the table doesn't necessarily mean that RED will, will be easy to implement. So what does... What does RED aim to do? RED is another land use option and it will be competing with um, things like agriculture for, for either biofuels, food production or cash crop production, as well as um, RED's intended to improve practices within the forestry sector. But that will also have to be competitive with other potential uses of forests, um, things like intensive timber harvesting, fueled and charcoal industries and illegal logging. Oh, sorry, that was in the scope. So um, the definition, reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. Sorry, A and B is where the, um, the name comes from. Um, so RED will necessarily involve trade-offs and trade-offs that will need to be made if countries decide to, to implement RED, and then trade-offs between various actors within countries. And a lot of that will depend on um, how RED is implemented, in that countries can, within that, that broad scope, that broad definitional scope, countries can choose how to achieve those emissions reductions. And that can be things like reducing illegal logging, um, improving the, the profitability of non-timber forest product sector and therefore um, being able to create a lot more national parks or right through to things like um, reforming agricultural sub subsidies where agriculture might be a driver of deforestation. Um, so there's a huge range of ways that, that RED could be, could be implemented. The distribution of costs and benefits 
between national governments and local communities particularly, as well as between um, different regions or different communities, will be really important in how much support RED has at the local level. And there's a lot of different types of costs that countries, I think, are just beginning to grapple with. Things like um, readiness costs, so the cost of building these monitoring, reporting and verification systems that will be needed to track carbon stocks within forests. Um, implementation costs, so if um, land use planning is required as part of your policy implementation, that obviously costs a lot of money and takes a lot of time. Um, transaction costs, so agreement negotiations and things. And opportunity costs, which has been estimated as the biggest proportion of red costs. So red is necessarily going to involve a change in behaviour and you need to somehow stimulate that change in behaviour by, by providing payments to people at least as much as the opportunity cost. Something else to mention about opportunity cost is that that will vary immensely between the land uses that RED is, is competing with and will also change over time as, as various markets and various um, other, other sectors change their policies. In terms of the benefits that RED may bring, these are monetary as well as non-monetary. So in terms of the monetary value, um, there's obviously the, the, the revenue from... Um, selling the carbon. There's also the potential for RED to include sustainable forest management. So you'll also have an additional revenue from, from timber products or by selling other ecosystem services that forests provide. So things like watershed services or um, biodiversity. So there's the potential for kind of um, grouping other payments onto the carbon payments. There's also a lot of non-monetary benefits that participating in RED will have for countries and for areas. So ecosystem services and other social and cultural values associated with protecting healthy, intact, standing forests. So as countries decide whether or not um, to pursue RED, cost-benefit analysis will be um, important both in determining whether it's a good idea but also in determining how to implement that and how you might do that in, in the best possible way for, for which types of actors. So there's a few different approaches in terms of cost-benefit analysis. The World Bank Institute has just started rolling out training courses um, for developing countries, which basically outlines the whole process about, on a national level, how you might go about estimating opportunity costs and what implications that has for your RED strategy development. There's also been some interesting work done in Indonesia looking at um, the competitiveness of RED um, versus palm oil. So palm oil um, plantation expansion is a big driver of deforestation in Indonesia. Um, and the results of that work showed that a carbon price of 18 to 46 US dollars a tonne would be needed to make red in the voluntary market um, competitive with, with palm oil sector. At the moment, the price of carbon is about $4 a tonne. So you can see just that disparity. If you're looking just at economic costs, at the moment, red really can't compete um, with other agricultural land uses. Um, there are, when, when looking sort of at the national and sector level, there's been other cost-benefit analysis work also done in Indonesia. And this gave, I guess, a, a bit more hope for people who see red as a much more transformational um, transformational mechanism to, to really reform land use um, and land use allocation and planning. So th this other report, which was actually um, funded by um, the British Foreign Office, um, showed that there were all these additional co-benefits of basically improving practices within the land use sector and things like um, reducing, um, reducing forest fires would provide sort of an additional 860 million in, in co-benefits to, to Indonesia and a whole range of things in terms of in, re, in increasing the productivity of palm oil plantations and removing them or not giving out new concessions on peatland but putting them on mineral soils which are more productive for palm oil production. So there's, there's a lot of... Um, a lot more than meets the eye in terms of cost-benefit analysis and obviously a lot more things to consider for countries than purely the economic costs and benefits. So this slide is just um, trying to demonstrate some of the economic trade-offs that exist within RED. Um, you can see the carbon stock and then the profit on the right-hand side. And then the next picture just demonstrates um, how much that complexity increases when you're comparing a number of different land uses, both in terms of carbon as well as the profits. Pardon? 
the second figure. Okay, so the carbon stock is on the, the left, um, and this just shows that natural forest um, holds a lot more carbon than these other forest uses. And then the kind of economic profit over a 30-year time frame demonstrates that natural forest is not competitive without some sort of support or financial incentive. So if you're making the um, decision on land use based strictly on, on the, the profit and the economic benefit, then you would choose agroforest based on the, that um, analysis. And then the second choice would be agriculture. But you can see in on the left-hand side, if you're trying to maximise carbon, um, reduce carbon emissions and maximise carbon sequestration, then you should choose the natural forest. So it can't, but agroforest is much better than agricultural pasture in terms of carbon sequestration. So it just demonstrates that there's lots of competing, there's not necessarily one win-win outcome and that there's all these various factors and um, kind of grey areas that need to be closely considered. So in terms of links with other sectors and, and how this sort of fits within the well nexus particularly, a lot of the drivers of deforestation are within these other sectors, like the agriculture and the energy sectors. And those linkages will, will really affect how the trade-offs play out and how um, competitive red is seen by countries. So for example, um, energy policies if, if the wood fuel industry is a driver of degradation or deforestation in a country, the energy policies that are promoted within that country will, will affect how RED is implemented and whether it's, it's effective. International bioenergy policies are largely driving biofuels feedstock production in many of these developing countries. Um, and so how a country decides to implement RED will, will therefore affect whether biofuels are a competitive um, product to continue growing in that area. Things like diet preferences and that, their impact on agricultural expansion and broader sectoral policies within the agriculture sector that alter the economics of um, expa agricultural expansion, intensification and how they interact with deforestation and therefore whether red is a viable option. So this slide shows sort of a rough estimate of a comparison between red and these other land use options and it, doesn't, doesn't try to incorporate all the potential land use options, but just gives sort of a flavour of a few. Um, I'll let you sort of look through and pick out which bits you think are interesting, but just something to draw your attention to is that many of the boxes have a question mark or are uncertain. They can't really be filled out, which is for a number of reasons. One is that how red will look is, is subject to significant uncertainty at the international, but also at the national level. So at the international level, as, as I mentioned, there's still lots of questions of finance and all that sort of thing to be figured out. At the national level, most countries haven't yet decided exactly how they're going to achieve the emissions reductions. Um, they're interested in doing it, but are still at very early stages of working out the strategy to do that. And how those strategies emerge, and particularly aspects like benefit sharing as well as um, the, the other sectors that will be involved as part of the RED strategy will really um, depend on, on how RED is able to deliver um, for, for vulnerable people and for inclusive growth, but also in terms of these economic and social, social aspects as well. Um, some of the other question marks depend a lot on how that particular land use is carried, carried out. So for example, um, agriculture for food production, um, that may be done in a way that is environmental, more environmentally friendly, so re with reduced emissions and lower inputs, or it may be done in an intensive kind of a way. Something else I guess I wanted to draw attention to is the importance of governance and that for RED to actually be effective, it's going to need transformational change within the land use sector. And not just governance, but broad political support will be really essential in making that happen, both at the national level as well as at the local and community level. Buy-in will be needed um, at, at all those levels. And as I mentioned before, whether RED is able to contribute to inclusive growth and sustainable development really depends on, on how it's framed and, and how it becomes implemented at the national level, things that are a bit too early to tell at this point.
And the final point I think is absolutely key to all of this and particularly in how red fits within um, the land use competitive um, environment, I guess, that really strategic land use planning will be needed to work out areas that are high priority for agriculture, high priority for um, nature conservation, which may involve red payments to make that a more economically viable sort of an option, and then other areas which may be kind of for urban growth or other things. But large-scale land use planning will be essential if red is actually going to, going to work on a long-term kind of a basis. Uh, so, yeah, the, the last slide was just um, a bit of a suggestion on how the report might be able to look further into some case study examples of, of how red is contributing and or sort of the, um, the conflicts that exist and that red might potentially be exacerbating in terms of the world nexus. The first one is um, those um, countries and the province, central Kalimantan, that I've listed uh, have all been really proactive in signing up to some voluntary standards for national level red to make sure that that meets specific social and environmental objectives as well as the carbon objectives. Um, so those, those would be logical countries to focus on if you're looking at a case study of how red can actually contribute to, to inclusive growth. Um, the, the other area, the, the second one is an area where there's a lot of competition for land. Um, there's been quite a lot of international donor um, input in terms of pushing, pushing red in that area, um, but it is an area that's highly profitable for palm oil production. So I guess, okay. yeah, that's all.